I'm really pleased to be here today to speak with you again. It's been quite some time, I think, since I got to speak to you. Many of you who have been here for a very long time have heard me talk about FD and the work that we put in to identify the FD gene and then understand what the mutation is that causes FD and then how we might treat it. Um, I spoke here, I think, I started coming, I think, 1991, 1992, so it's been many, many, many years that I came. And so I'm really pleased to tell you just a very short bit about the work that we're doing in my lab currently. But I wanted to start by introducing the FD team. So um, four of them are here. If you guys could stand up. I'm not gonna, you don't have to come stand up here, but. <laughs> so this is Elisabetta, who is a junior faculty member in my group, and Emily, who's a research technician, and Monica, who's the manager of the lab, and then Aram, who is, um, a research scientist in the group. So I wanted to begin, so um, they'll be here for the rest of the afternoon too, and I'm sure would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. So I just wanted to start, I know Horatio mentioned this this morning, but I just wanted to remind you as we head into this discussion um, what the DNA mutation that uh, causes FD does. And it disrupts something called RNA splicing. And so if you, I guess we don't have a pointer, huh? Does this? This is, can you see this? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. So this, this single base change, so this T to C change in patients that have FD, um, when they have it homozygous, meaning they have two copies of this, what it does is it, it causes a disruption of something called RNA splicing in a gene called, that we called for many, a long time, IKB cap, now we call it ALP1. It's a long story why. Yeah, I'll tell you later why the name changed, but the correct name is ELP1 or elongator protein 1. And so what happens in the normal case is exon 19 joins exon 20, joins exon 21, and this piece of the gene contains instructions for making a protein. And what happens with this, this base changes is that we end up with exon 19 joining to 21. The instructions are not appropriate, and therefore we don't get protein made. And this is what happens in patients with FD. They don't have enough ELP1 protein. So I just wanted to put this in to remind you what we're talking about. Because what I want to talk about is a little bit about the work that we do in my lab with mice. So you've heard me talk about our mice for a long time. And what I want to tell you about is the work that we've done just over the last couple of years. And that is because for a long time, if you might remember, that we worked with mice that we were able to study splicing in. So we basically took the gene from people and we put it in mice. And we were able to study splicing in these mice, but they didn't have FD. They were perfectly normal mice. They didn't have the disease because they had their own mouse eye cap, so they were fine. And so we worked very hard and in collaboration with um, Giannis Dragatsis' lab at the University of Tennessee to produce a mouse that had FD as a disease. So we wanted to give these mice FD and we wanted to create a mouse that, in which we would be able to um, test drugs that modulate splicing. So in 2016, we published a paper that describing this mouse. So here he is. I just wanted to include a picture so you could see what he looks like there. Um, and it was published in a, in a journal called Human Molecular Genetics. And basically what we were able to see was that the new mouse that we made has many features of FD. So they have reduced growth, as you can see on this graph. So they don't grow as well as um, their normal what uh, litter mates. They have kyphosis, and they have reduction in the number of fungiform papillae on their tongue. So this is in the normal case. You can see this is what a normal fungiform papillae looks like. You know kids with FD don't have fungiform papillae on their tongue. Neither, neither do the mice. And also, this mouse, importantly, misplices the gene just like FD patients do. Okay, so those of you who have seen me talk for a long time, you're used to looking at this. Basically what you're looking at here is what the normal instructions look like or the normal gene looks like versus the mutant here. This is the um, gene without the exon, which I've shown over here on the right. And so now that we had this mice, we were able to ask ourselves, if we treat with drugs or use other methods to fix the splicing, can we study these mice to see if, in fact, it will help the disease? And so this is the question we ask. Can we treat this mouse with compounds that change splicing and see if it gets better? 
And so until two years ago, or two and a half years ago, we really weren't able to do that. So we had to make that mouse, we had to study that mouse, determine if it had symptoms of FD, and then begin treatment to see if we could do it. That's exactly what we did. And so this um, project was led by Elisabetta in the lab. And so what we did was we tested Kinetin. You've heard us talk a lot about Kinetin over the years. Uh, it is a compound that we identified in 2005 as a way that we can modify splicing. So basically what we're doing is taking, we're increasing the amount of the um, message or the RNA that can give appropriate instructions to make protein. And so basically what we did, this is a complicated slide, but we fed the mice Kinetin and then asked, does it fix the splicing? Does it help them grow better? What does it do to motor coordination? And we looked at the neurons and looked in the mice and then what does it do to kyphosis? And so this paper was just published this year, a few months ago, um, showing that in fact, when we treated these mice with Kinetin, we can improve motor coordination in the mice and um, kyphosis in this mouse model. And so we were really pleased with these results because this was really the first time that we were ever able to show that if you can change splicing and increase the amount of protein, that we would see that the symptoms of the disease FD in these mice got better. And so we would do various testing on these mice where we could assess motor coordination. And you can see on this picture right here, this is a control at the top. This is an untreated mouse, and this is a treated mouse. And so it was able to rescue some of the kyphosis as well. And then what about the neurons? We also looked at the neurons. So Kinetin was able to increase the volume of the dorsal root ganglia, or ganglia are, are collection of cell bodies, and also increase the number of proprioceptive neurons. Now you've heard over the years, Horatio and others from the FD Center talk about proprioception, right? The ability to sense where your legs are in space, right? And we think about the gait when we talk about proprioception. And so we were able to increase the amount of um, the number of proprioceptive neurons. So what does this mean? It means that Kinetin corrects the ELP1 misplicing in mice and increases the protein. And so if we can correct splicing, then we can hopefully improve motor coordination, kyphosis, DRG volume, number of proprioceptive neurons in mice. And I put this big because we all know mice aren't people. Right? Mice are not people. So we are able to do this in mice, but this data gives us a lot of hope that in fact, if we're able to increase the amount of protein in our FD patients, that we will be able to treat some symptoms of the disease. So we all know that Kinetin is not a great drug for people. Many of you who have been involved for a very long time, we did some studies on Kinetin. And so for the last number of years, we have worked to improve Kinetin. So we can, Kinetin isn't very potent meaning it takes a lot of Kinetin to do this job. We had to give these mice a significant amount of this drug. And it's not great for patients. It made patients nauseous when we've tested it in a few patients. And so we worked very hard over the last many several years in order to improve Kinetin, get a better Kinetin, super Kinetin we call it. So in 2012, with funding from the NIH, um, as part of the NINDS Blueprint for Neuroscience Research Program, we began the search for what we lovingly termed many years ago, superconetin. And then um, with this work continued where we did medicinal chemistry. So we took the actual chemical structure of that molecule and we improved it and tested it and improved it and tested it. And it's an iterative process by where you make new compounds and you ask if they're better or worse. And you continue this process. And then in 2015, we were very lucky because we formed a partnership with PTC Therapeutics, and many members of PTC are here today, and you've met them, and um, actually Nikolai spoke here uh, in years past. And now we have, um, I, I said here, the search for superconnectin goes into overdrive, because it was really PTC Therapeutics who really took this project on, and in collaboration with folks at the FD Center and with us, have really, you know, things just started going much quicker than they were before, let me just say that. So um, the work to create what we now call PTC258 um, continued, where more compounds were made. In fact, o over a thousand, I think in total in the whole program, we made about 500 new compounds 
under the Blueprint Project and over a thousand at PTC. And so it really shows you just a remarkable amount of medicinal chemistry that was done to land on PTC 258, which is a molecule that we hope will become a drug. And the name of the game, how we got this far is really collaboration. So we're all working together both the folks at my lab, all of us at my lab, at PTC, my lab goes there with Frances and her team in Montana. We're making a trip to Montana. The folks at the FD Center who are constantly telling us about what, you know, what the patients are doing. And, what, and so really it's collaboration and we need all of you because the next steps in this process, we'll, we will need everybody. We'll need everybody that has FD because the next step will really be um, developing this drug and testing it in FD patients. And for that, we need all of you. And we need to get the message out there about the exciting research that's happening and um, the work that needs to happen. And we need all of you. And in, before I leave you, I will just, I wanted to say a few words about other work that's going on at Mass General. Um, we are currently testing PTC258 in our FD mice. Um, we also have a study um, on the retina. You heard from um, Francis that they're looking at the retina, so Elisabetta and Francis have written a grant together to make new mice in order to be better study the eyes in FD. We're trying to figure out how these drugs might work. We're looking at FD IPS cells, or induced pluripotent stem cells, to see how these drugs might work in those type of cells asking questions about um, will they work in other diseases, and then, as I mentioned, working with Francis to create even better mouse models. Because that mouse model that I showed you, that little guy is sick, as you know, because you have kids with FD. Those mice are sick, and they're hard to work with, and we don't get that many of them. And so we're trying to see if we can create a model in which we can um, uh, still have symptoms of FD, but yet they're healthier so that they're easier for us to work with so we can generate more of them. So that is just a brief summary of the work that we're doing. We remain completely devoted and dedicated to FD, and I'm really glad that I was able to bring my team here this year and that they got to meet many of you, and I'm glad to see all of you. And um, with that, I will turn it over to Lucy from the center. <laughs>